Good morning, good evening, whatever time it is where you're watching. Thank you for joining us today for another Parkinson's Life educational presentation by Smart XPD. Today, we'll be learning about cognition and Parkinson's from Dr. Megan Gomez, staff psychologist at the Tybar Rubin VA Medical Center in Long Beach, California. I'm Patrick Lasasso, president of Smart XPD and coordinator of our Parkinson's Life discussion group. This is a place where we come together to unite, strengthen, and share. If you enjoy Smart XPD, please consider making a contribution. You can find a thanks button to do so on the YouTube channel banner, or there are payment options in your email notifications. Now, on to today's presentation. Dr. Gomez provides psychological assessment and treatment interventions to veterans and also provides psychology support to their family caregivers. She completed her postdoctoral training at the USC Keck School of Medicine, where she was part of a research team investigating the impact of physical exercise and social engagement on cognition for people with Parkinson's. That sounds so cool. She continues to facilitate a Parkinson's support group, which she developed in 2016, is on, and is on the board of advisors for the Parkinson's Foundation California chapter. In her free time, she enjoys spending time outdoors with her husband, seven-year-old daughter, and two-year-old son. How fun. Please give a warm Smart XPD welcome to Megan Gomez. Great. Hi, everybody. I can tell you guys are a fun group. I'm so excited to join you guys. Thank you for letting me present today. I'm going to get my slides going here. Can you guys see that? Yes, it looks great. Perfect. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so as, as Patrick mentioned, I'm a psychologist at the VA and I get to work a lot with people with Parkinson's and with their family caregivers. Just a quick disclaimer, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I have my PhD in clinical psychology, so I am not a medical doctor, I don't prescribe medications, but what I do is work with people with Parkinson's and their families to help sort of support them on this journey of Parkinson's. Parkinson's is also very near and dear to my heart on a personal level. My grandfather had Parkinson's, and I have just really come to love the Parkinson's community. So super excited to be with you guys today. No financial disclosures to report. Um, and these are my professional opinions based on research and clinical practice. They don't represent the VA or the government in any capacity. So just a quick outline for what we're going to talk about today. First, I'm going to explain what is cognition. Then we're going to talk about cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease, and then what we can do about it. So I like to spend a lot of time on empowering you to sort of compensate for any cognitive changes that you may experience in order to be able to live a full life um, that you feel that you have good quality of life, despite some of these challenges. My goal is to finish the talk at about 35 minutes after so that we can have some good time for questions and answers. I feel like the discussion part is, is where the, the meat of the conversation and where you guys can learn from each other. I often say in the group that I facilitate, you guys are the experts, you have the experience, you guys know this better than anyone. So when we talk about cognition, we break it into different cognitive domains. So psychologists and neuropsychologists will evaluate each of these different areas of your performance. So the first one is your attention. How well are you able to pay attention to what you're trying to focus on and blocking out all of the distractions? in the environment, as well as in your own head. Information processing speed. How quickly can you understand the information that you're either hearing from other people, that you're reading in a text? Um, how quickly can you keep up? How fast can your brain operate? And then there's language, which can be divided into two different components your receptive language. So again, being able to understand what other people are saying, as well as your expressive language, your ability to express your thoughts, feelings, being able to articulate yourself, um, whether that be verbally or also in written format. 
And then there's visual spatial functioning. How well are you able to perceive your environment? How well are you able to navigate your environment? Um, are you able to get from point A to point B? A lot of vision changes happen with Parkinson's, which we know, which can impact this. Executive functioning, which I'm sure all of you guys have heard about before, which is one of the domains that's most affected in Parkinson's disease. Our frontal lobe sits here just behind our forehead, and that uh, is responsible for lots of different tasks, such as problem solving, being able to tackle a goal or a task, being able to multitask, being able to use good judgment making decisions. So lots of those more complicated things that we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then there's learning and memory, which is also tied with attention. So in order to learn new information, we first have to be able to pay attention to it. So we pay attention to the information, our brain encodes the information, and then when we need to retrieve that information, our brain has to be able to sort through all of the knowledge that we have and quickly and efficiently pull out that person's name or pull out that street or pull out the TV show. So being able to attend to the information, our brain encodes the information and being able to pull out the information. And then motor functioning, believe it or not, is actually a cognitive domain. There's a lot of cognitive aspects to motor functioning. So when we age, all of our cognitive performance tends to decline after the age of about 40. So we're all in our peak between 25 and 35 when it comes to cognitive ability. And then with each passing decade, our brain becomes a little less efficient. And this is normal. This is expected for everybody. There's a few things that continue to go up or, or stay steady. And those are things like wisdom, our ability to, to sort of synthesize all of our life experiences and to be able to think about things in a healthy perspective. But the truth is we all tend to get a little slower. We all have more trouble with that retrieval process, being able to pull that information out quickly when we need to. Um, and we, we tend to slow down. Of course, with Parkinson's disease, sometimes these, these changes can be amplified. So there's three cognitive classifications, three categories that people can fall into. One, you're right where you should be for your age and level of education and occupational attainment, right where you should be. What you're experiencing are normal age-related changes. The second category is mild cognitive impairment, meaning when we compare you to people the same age as you with the same education level, and similar occupations, you're performing a little worse than we would expect, but you're still independent in managing your finances, managing your medications, you're still driving, you're still keeping up with all of your appointments without any difficulty. And then the third category is major cognitive impairment or dementia. This is when you start having problems managing the medications or the finances. Um, this is when the driving becomes an issue. And so as a psychologist or a neuropsychologist, we diagnose you into one of these three categories. We also, of course, want to ask you, what cognitive changes have you experienced? Tell me about each of those cognitive domains. How is your ability to express yourself? How is your ability to keep up with the pace of a conversation? Does it feel like people are talking really fast? Um, how is your decision making? How are you able to address challenges that come up? So we sort of go over that interview, looking at all those domains. And then it's also really helpful to ask family members or people that know you well, how do you think so-and-so is doing? 
Um, and all of this information, along with how you're doing on cognitive tests, help us determine which category you fall into. So dementia is an umbrella term, and there's a lot of different types of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. Sometimes people think Alzheimer's disease and dementia are synonymous, but in fact, Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia. There's also Parkinson's disease dementia, vascular disease dementia, uh, dementia due to substance abuse, due to traumatic brain injury, frontal temporal dementia, dementia due to Huntington's disease. And so the different type of dementia that you have is going to help us understand how quickly would we expect your dementia to progress? What uh, cognitive domains are most likely to be impacted? For example, we know that Alzheimer's disease impacts memory, whereas Parkinson's disease impacts that information processing speed, that executive functioning, um, that retrieval of information, and it also can impact language and visual spatial functioning. So just remember, there's lots of different types of dementia. <clears throat> In Alzheimer's disease, that affects this blue part, the temporal lobe, which is where memories are stored. But again, Parkinson's disease primarily affects that frontal lobe. So two different people can have two different types of dementia, and it can look very differently and impact their lives in very different ways. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. I mentioned that executive functioning, right? And so I have the unique experience of being able to work with people with Parkinson's in two different capacities. Sometimes I go out and meet with a person with Parkinson's because they want to participate in neuropsychological testing or cognitive testing. And the goal of that assessment is to determine which of those three categories do they fall into, normal aging, mild cognitive impairment, or that major cognitive impairment or dementia. Other times, I'm referred to meet with the person with Parkinson's to assess how they're doing emotionally, right? Sometimes they're having anxiety related to the Parkinson's, depression related to the Parkinson's, relational stress, and the Parkinson's can sort of exacerbate that. Um, sometimes they have a lot of pain, chronic pain that I help them with. And a lot of times the way in which they explain to me what's going on, I can kind of get a sense how they're doing cognitively, even if that wasn't necessarily the referral question. I also get referrals to work with family caregivers, and the, the family caregiver will explain to me um, what's going on with the person with Parkinson's in terms of how they're doing with these different domains. So we talked about executive functioning, motor functioning, of course, is, is impacted with Parkinson's, and sometimes the cognitive can mirror or mimic those motor symptoms. So just as someone with Parkinson's may move more slowly, they also think more slowly. Just as a person with Parkinson's may feel more stiff or rigid, not as flexible, we can also see that in their thinking, where they become more rigid in their thinking. It can become more black and white. They don't have that cognitive flexibility to be able to be flexible. Uh, the plan of the day changes and they can sort of roll with it. Or an event got canceled. That's okay. I can do this instead. Sometimes when, when things change, it can be a little difficult to be flexible with things and to sort of, sort of roll with it. You want things to go a particular way. Information processing speed. So as I mentioned, it may seem as if people are speaking fast. I hear this particularly on the television and on the telephone, that people say it's hard for me to keep up with a conversation. 
And I encourage them to, to ask someone to slow down or to repeat themselves or to follow up with an email where they can put all of that in an email for you so you can come back to it and reference it later. And then that language ability. So I think language ability can be one of the, the biggest sources of frustration. I hear so often from people with Parkinson's that they, they're they very self-conscious of how they come across in a social situation. They have such a hard time sort of putting their thoughts into words or because they can't formulate their thoughts quickly enough, by the time they're able to, to get what they want to say out, it feels like the conversation has already passed that part. And, and sometimes it can seem as if that person isn't interested in the conversation because they're quiet. But in fact, it can be that combination of the slower processing speed and the difficulty being able to formulate your responses in a quick and timely manner that you may find that you're listening a lot more than talking. Um, another aspect of that is that when you have Parkinson's, you're not as attuned to what's happening in your body. So I hear so often wives of people with Parkinson's or husbands of people with Parkinson's saying, I have to tell so-and-so all the time to drink water. If I don't tell them to drink the water, even if it's sitting right in front of them, they won't do it. And a lot of that is, is the executive functioning piece of that, that internal monitoring. I haven't drank water in a while, or my, my mouth is dry, I should drink water. A lot of those internal cues, which would propel us to get the water and drink it, are not happening. So I think it's really important to rely on external cues to help us do those things, whether it's your family member or loved one encouraging you to do it, whether it's getting the, the water bottle that's time stamped. So every couple hours you need to drink to that line, setting alarms. Um, I think the more we can delegate, whether that be um, alarms, to-do list, putting it on our calendar, the, the more helpful it will be. Because if we rely on our, ourselves to remember and to get those internal cues, sometimes it, it won't happen. Visual spatial functioning. So I alluded earlier to some of the vision changes that can happen with Parkinson's. Sometimes it can be the acuity of the image is not as sharp or not as clear as it used to be. Sometimes the eyes don't come together, and so sometimes it can it can present as a double vision. We know that our eyes, our retinas, are very dependent on dopamine in order to function well. So just like our, our body relies on that dopamine and our brain relies on that dopamine, so too do our eyes. And if it's not getting enough dopamine, we can oftentimes have vision changes. And there's also the visual illusions or visual misperceptions where you misperceive something in the environment. So the classic example is that coat rack with the hat on it and how you can misperceive that to be a person. Um, and that that's distinguishable from visual hallucinations, which aren't really in the environment, but a misperception, there's something really there. It could be a shadow, it could be a plant, it could be a piece of furniture, and we're just perceiving it to be something different. All right, this next graph can look a little bit complicated, but what it's aimed at illustrating is that there's two main circuits in our brain that are dependent on dopamine. The top is the motor somatosensory part of our brain. And that is the area of our brain that controls movement. And then the prefrontal cortex is that frontal circuit, that executive functioning circuit. So you can see that motor and executive functioning are two areas of the brain, two circuits of the brain that are very dependent on that dopamine. So in Parkinson's disease, this is where we see some of those changes occurring. Um, at the earlier stages, and that continue, of course, to progress. 
So a lot of the, the parts of our functioning that once were automatic sort of stop becoming automatic. That automaticity sort of goes away. So things that are automatic occur without our conscious awareness. So much, so many things are happening in our body without us being aware of it. They occur without our intention. They happen quickly. They require little effort. And everyday judgments and behaviors rely on that automaticity. I have the picture of the walking because a lot of times when you don't have Parkinson's, you walk without thinking about it. But when you have Parkinson's, sometimes that automatic ability goes away and everything becomes intentional. Everything requires effort. Everything requires concentration. So it can feel like every step you have to think about. It's not as fluid or automatic as it used to be. It now requires attention and it can happen more slowly and it requires more effort. So I gave the example of walking. Reading is another really good example that before Parkinson's or without Parkinson's, reading can happen really fluidly, really naturally, automatically. But when you have Parkinson's or start to notice some of these cognitive changes, you may notice that it's one word, one word, one word, one word, and you're really having to focus on each word. And then you reach the end of the sentence and you sort of have to put it all together, which was something you never had to do before. But that automaticity goes away and you your brain has to really focus on being able to do that same task which of course leads to more fatigue, right? And, and the reading and the walking are not as leisurely anymore. Sometimes they're not as enjoyable. Now it feels so cumbersome and like such a, so much effort is required that you may convert from reading the novels to reading something much more simple and easy to digest. Or you may convert to audiobooks or you may only read when absolutely necessary. We know that it's really hard for people with Parkinson's to multitask, right? Um, a lot of times Parkinson's requires so much multitasking and, and you need to be so organized with Parkinson's. You have so many different medical providers that you have to see, so many appointments that you have to keep track of so many medications to refill. Um, there, there seems to be such a long to-do list just to sort of manage your Parkinson's disease that it can be overwhelming to do all of the other, other things on top of it. A lot of times people feel like their, their motivation can really be depleted, that they, they're content kind of just sitting in their comfortable chair in their own comfortable environment with the TV shows that they like. It's very predictable. They can get to the bathroom easily. It's sort of their zone, their element where they're most comfortable. And I never hear the person with Parkinson's saying, you know, I'm just not motivated to do things. I usually hear that from the family caregiver who says, I want them to get out. They need to do things. We have birthday parties to go to. We have grandkids soccer games to go to. And it's such a chore for me to try to get them motivated to want to do something. And that can really be a result of some of the brain changes that are happening. It can be really hard for the person with Parkinson's to sort of stop, take a step back and look at the big picture these changes happen very slowly and very gradually. And if we don't stop and take notice of some of these changes, our lives and our world can become very small. We can find that we don't have a desire to really leave our house. And yet that's the worst thing we can do, right? We become socially isolated. Um, and our, our cognition really declines when we just stick to ourselves in our same routine day in and day out without a lot of stimulation. 
So even if you don't feel like going to the birthday party, even if you don't want to stay for the whole soccer game, go even if it's just for 20 minutes. Our brain needs that stimulation and that, that novelty, going to new places, seeing new faces, talking to people we haven't spoken to before. Our brain really benefits from all of that stimulation outside of the house. Uh, on the contrary, sometimes I hear from spouses, he doesn't do what he needs to do, but he'll get distracted with things that are either dangerous or risky, unnecessary, a huge distraction from what he really needs to do. And sometimes we have that impulse or that, that strong urge to go do something. We become really fixated on an unnecessary task but we don't wanna do all the things that we really should do. So as I mentioned earlier, some of the cognitive changes can mirror those motor symptoms, right? The slowness, getting stuck. So just like we freeze or feel like we're off physically, we can also experience feeling off cognitively where we're just, the gears are just not clicking. We're just really having a hard time concentrating and, and paying attention to what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, we talked about that rigidity and that cognitive flexibility, um, being able to be okay with plan B, being able to quickly adapt to something unexpected that comes up. And just as we get fatigued physically, we can also get fatigued mentally, cognitively. And it makes a lot of sense if everything that we're doing requires that uh, effort, right? That concentration, the walking requires effort, the reading requires effort, conversation requires effort, having to think of every word that we need to say in order to formulate a sentence. Everything can feel really burdensome, really exhausting. And it can be a lot easier to just sit in our comfy chair and watch TV where we're not having to challenge ourselves to do these things even though they're difficult. So there's a lot of disruption that goes on internally when we have Parkinson's, that internal rhythm can really get thrown off. We can feel really clumsy, really uncoordinated physically, but also cognitively where it just, everything feels clunky. Nothing seems to just flow easily. That synchronicity can come down. Um, sometimes it feels like different parts of our brain are just not communicating correctly or certain parts of our body are not syncing up with our brain. It can just feel like the communication in our brain and from our brain to our body are not happening easily. I've, I've had some people explain where they have to say, okay, brain connect with your right leg and move it. And it's like, these are things you never had to consciously think about before. So again, that lack of coordination, and then of course that circadian rhythm can really get disrupted. You're sleeping during the day and you're awake at night. Um, and of course, if we're not getting that good night's sleep, we're grumpy the next day. We don't wanna do what we previously committed to doing. Um, and sleep is a, a whole other talk for another day. But I think it's really important to understand the disruption that occurs so that one, we can have self-compassion, that we can have empathy with ourselves or empathy with our loved one that has Parkinson's. They're not just being difficult. They're not just being stubborn. They're not just being apathetic to be a jerk, that there's so many things that are going on in their body. And sometimes they're not able to put it into words. They're not able to put into words why they feel crappy. They're not able to put into words why they just don't feel like they're having a good day. And there's so many different elements that can impact their ability to express that to you. And as the caregiver, you can feel like you have to be a mind reader. You have to be so attuned. Is it a good day or a bad day? Is it a good hour or a bad hour? There's so many different subtle things that you're having to pick up on because that verbal communication may not be what it used to be. 
I mentioned those fluctuations, right? It can be so difficult to plan ahead because you don't know, is it going to be a good morning or a bad morning? You really have to be flexible. Um, and having people in your life that are flexible with you and that understand it might be a bad day and they're not going to make you feel bad about it is so important. Um, and then medication. We know that medication can sometimes be working. We're optimized. We're feeling on. And then before our next dose, you may feel like you're off. And that is when cognitive abilities can really be impacted. Our anxiety can go up when we're feeling off and when we're anxious, we're not able to think as clearly. So I think so many people have to learn that Parkinson's is consistently inconsistent, right? Some days you can do things easily. Some days it seems impossible. Some days you're in a good mood. Some days it's really hard to do the bare minimum. So I think it, it can be a challenge for the person with Parkinson's to not know what kind of day it's going to be. And also for those around you to have to be flexible as well. Um, so just the impact on family, I think it can be really confusing, those fluctuations, to wonder, like, is this person faking is this person being difficult? Is this their personality? Is this the Parkinson's? How much should I push them? Should I just not be a nag and lay off? I think these are all completely normal questions to ask yourself if you're the family. It's confusing. And sometimes the person with Parkinson's is conflicted. They know they should exercise. And when you encourage them to do it, they're more likely to do it. But also, when they're in pain and they're tired, having someone say you got to exercise is not something that they want to hear in the moment, even if they know it's good for them. So it's so hard to be able to navigate that while maintaining a good relationship and, and not reaching the point of mutual frustration when you just feel like you're both on edge with each other. So what can we do about it? I gave myself one minute to cover this. We'll go through it quickly, but we can also address this with questions. The first thing is being physically active. Number one thing that you can do for your brain health, and I would argue your mental health, is staying physically active. I don't care if you're walking. I don't care if you're on a bike. I don't care if you're boxing. I don't care if you're dancing. I don't care if you're gardening, if you're cleaning, whatever it is getting that heart rate up, getting that blood circulating throughout your body. It's so important. And finding an activity that you enjoy, if you can, finding people that will do that activity with you, whether it's a friend, whether it's a physical therapist. I think one of the, the best things you can do is, is figure out why you're not exercising, if you're not, and, and being able to have a plan for how to combat whatever challenges come up. Number two, reduce, reducing cardiovascular risk factors. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if you smoke, really trying to get those conditions under control. And then managing your medications. We know that people with Parkinson's have to take a lot of medications and you have to take them frequently. So you've heard time and time again, take your medications on time. If you're not, again, problem solving, what's getting in the way of you taking your medication and then talking with the pharmacist or talking with your physician about are there medications we can eliminate? We know that with every medication, there's oftentimes side effects and the medications can just be so complicated with the regimen that you have. So I think if you can delegate the medication, ask someone to help you fill up your, your pill box for the month so that you're not having to scramble and open lots of different pill boxes at different times and whatever you need to do to simplify the medication um, management, I think is really big. <clears throat> Should we stop here and we can talk about questions and I can answer them. Sure. And I also sent Patrick a copy of my slides, so hopefully he can get those out to everybody. Absolutely. Um, wonderful content. Really, really, really interesting. Um, so here's what I think we should do. Let's, um, 
yes, go to uh, our gallery view and I'll kind of navigate this. Um, make sure everybody that you're familiar with uh, how to unmute and mute yourself. So what I'll ask is if you have a question, you can just either um, virtually raise your hand or raise your hand and then I will come to you. So uh, we'll open up. Thank you so much, Megan. This was fabulous. Um, yeah, uh, really informative and um, and helpful. So uh, any questions, raise your hand. Otherwise, I will. I have a couple of questions. Okay, Carol. Just one quick question. It was a wonderful presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, does doing things like crossword puzzles and word games help the cognitive? Absolutely. Yes. The more cognitive stimulation that you can do, the better. Yes. Jigsaw puzzles, word searches, whatever it is that you enjoy. Don't do something that you hate because you think that it'll be good for you. Find something that you're excited about, something that feels good when you accomplish it. But yes, the more cognitive stimulation that you can do, the better. I think attending these sorts of talks are really helpful. Go to a museum, anything that where you can learn something new is going to be so helpful for your brain. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, you guys, most of you are all very up to speed. I, I guess we're kind of talking about the non-motor conditions that can occur with Parkinson's, particularly the apathy and the isolation, which we've seen a lot of. Um, so part of your 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 mission to fight back is to acknowledge those potentials, uh, identify them, and make decisions like Megan's encouraging you to do to get out there and to do the stuff, even when you don't feel up to it. Marty, you got your hand up, or I assume that's maybe you can pop yourself off of mute if you have a question. Yes, thank thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I kind of blanked out on uh, what you were talking about, diabetes, which, which I have. I guess the corrective action is just keep it under control. Absolutely. Yes. So there's such a, such a connection with our brain health and, and those conditions, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, the high cholesterol. So keeping those conditions under control, keeping your numbers good, whether that's through diet, whether it's through medication, um, whatever you can do, exercise, of course, is not only going to help you with, with the Parkinson's and with cognition, it's also going to help you with, with those conditions as well. So we know that if those conditions, the high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, if they're not treated, that over time, they can have a, a negative impact on our brain. And that's why people can develop dementia due to vascular disease, right? So it's it's a really important thing to to keep your numbers under control when you have those conditions. That answered my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marty. Okay, Lee, go ahead. It's I'm going to ask. It's Lee's car caregiver, Susan. My question is: I know there's new medications for Alzheimer's. Is there anything new for uh, Parkinson's dementia? Yes. So there's a couple medications that have been FDA approved for Parkinson's disease, dementia, um, modest impact. So only a slight percentage of people notice a benefit when they take those medications and side effects can be pretty nasty. So if, if you want to try the medications, I think you you can, but just keep in mind there's so many side effects and sometimes the the benefit of those medications isn't what we would want it to be. Sometimes people with Parkinson's disease, dementia, are prescribed a medication for Alzheimer's disease, but we know that there's different chemicals in the brain that are impacted, different parts of the brain and different functions of the brain that are impacted. Some people are still prescribed those medications. And again, I would just be cautious that it feels like you're getting enough benefit because there is a lot of risk with the medications. Thank you, and your presentation was great. Thank you for that also. Of course. Thank you, Susan and Lee. Uh, Ruth, do you have, I see Ruth has her hand up. So be ready to, okay, Bill, I'll come to you after that. Hi, can be you ready. hear me? We Megan? can hear you. Megan, I thought your presentation was 
riveting. I've, I've heard a lot of presentations, but this one I really listened to. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I mean, I really heard it and wanted to hear it. Um, because everything else is slowing down and is in a state of aberration with regard to having Parkinson's, are you, is, is a person with Parkinson's inclined to get dementia much more so than someone who doesn't have it? Yes, the risk of developing dementia is higher for people that have Parkinson's disease. Yes. So I, I think it's so important to, to not feel like you're on this Parkinson's journey alone. Um, it used to be the, the science used to say 80% of people with Parkinson's over the long haul will develop dementia. But just in the last six months, a new study came out and said, no, it's not that high. It's only about 50% of people with Parkinson's will go on to develop dementia over the long haul. So What's that the long was, haul? What's the long haul? Is it 20 years? I mean, what if you were diagnosed closer to a, an old age to begin with? Yes. Over the long haul, meaning during the duration of the disease, how until death, um, about, yeah, so that's a huge change from 80% to 50%. So that gives a lot of hope that there's a lot that you can do. Someone mentioned the cognitive stimulation is huge. Staying socially engaged. Being by yourself is like the worst thing you could do uh, for your brain health, for your mental health, for your overall health. So cognitive engagement, social engagement, and then physical engagement and spiritual engagement, feeling like you're a part of something bigger than yourself, getting yourself out of your own head and your own problems is so important, whether that is being a part of your church community, volunteering, going to AA, whatever it is where you feel like you're connected to something bigger than yourself is so important in helping you hold on to that hope and and giving you a sense of meaning and purpose in life. That's that's so wonderful. That's so wonderful. And I, I like to think that our gathering here uh, online uh, would check Absolutely. a box for that as well. Um, yeah. And the you know the I think that there's been a really organic and exchange of uh, thoughts and and feelings and participation in in the world through our our time here and you know our time with your there are online support groups like uh, Megan says she runs a, a support group you know support groups aren't right for everyone uh, sometimes you go and you see things that are scary um, but the the point that Megan makes about uh, participating and getting involved is so important and I've been doing this working in the community for 20 years and I'll just share a bit of the light. I'm glad I went from 80% to 50% of dementia, but even in my uh, experience, 50% still feels high. So let's, you know, uh, maybe, maybe they'll pull that one back too at some point. Uh, uh, so um, stay hopeful. What's that? We're trending in the right direction. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We are trying to <laughs> victory. Right. Uh, Bill, Bill, yeah, let's go to you. Thank you. Uh, I got in a little bit late and missed a bit of it. But it was a wonderful lecture, and I appreciate it. And uh, I work out with Patrick and then on TV uh, every day. And what I was going to ask you is about, like, I, I've played golf all my life. And I, I go out to play golf, but I don't. we play 10 holes or 12 holes, and I don't hit the ball as far as I used to, I guess because I'm old. I'm past 80. And then the other thing was, we discussed with Patrick, and I think I know the answer about driving, that we shouldn't drive. So th there's my comments, and thank you so much for a, a wonderful talk. Yes, and I love that you still go golfing. I think you're getting so much by going golfing. You may not be as competitive as you might be, but you're still out there on the green. You're still getting the fresh air. You're still surrounded by people that share that interest with you. You're still a part of it and being able to be in that space. I feel like that's so good for you. Don't worry you. about your score. Go out there and have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
The other thing Bill forgot to tell you when he said he played golf his entire life is he should have said, I played golf poorly my entire life. <laughs> Just, kidding. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Just kidding. I was pretty uh, good at one time. I'm sure you were. Uh, okay. Butcher. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, do we have a, let's see another. Okay. Uh, Michael Lander and, and <laughs> partner. So there he is. And she is. Yes. I'm I'm Michael's wife and I am the caregiver and I just want everybody to know that the REACH program um, that the VA has has been a blessing in our household. I have learned so much on how to do what I need to do the right way and I just I just want to thank you guys. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you shared that because I I wanted to emphasize how important it is for the person with Parkinson's to assemble their team, their mental health provider, their occupational therapist, their speech therapist, their physical therapist, um, their social support. But it's equally as important for the family caregivers to assemble their team. I think you need just as much support as the person with Parkinson's, as Patrick said, it affects the whole family. So the fact that you're open to receiving that support is the first step. I think putting yourself out there, whether it be in a group, whether it be with a new medical provider or therapist, I think it's so important to, to be willing to receive that support. None of us can do it by ourselves. That's right. And there are, for those of you that are care partners, there are support groups exclusively for care partners, for the, you know, the experience of living and caring for someone with Parkinson's. You really, um, you, you, you need to, it's one of the things, unfortunately, we have to, we have to research and we have to manage and we have to care for ourselves, even if we're not the one with Parkinson's. So important. Um, okay. Uh, hang on, Bill. I'll come back to you with Sharon. Can you put pop yourself off of mute, Sharon? Yes, um, I attended a, a presentation on um, VTRAX access balance. I wondered if you've heard of anything with that. Advanced computerized postureography system. And they also spoke about biofeedback for Parkinson's where they, um, put little electrodes up to your, your head and they measure and train your brain to be have better activity. Yes, the first one I haven't heard of, biofeedback. Yeah, I think biofeedback can be really helpful. Maybe the first thing you mentioned too, but I'm just not familiar with it. Okay. But I think, again, being open-minded to trying these different things and if you like it, and if you see benefit, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Bill, did you have a bill? Yeah, I did. I'm, so, I'm sorry to take up more time. Uh, I forgot to ask you, I walk real good, but it's starting where my hips are starting to hurt when I walk, but then it, it goes away. Have you had that happen with your patients or students or what? Yes, I'm convinced that there's some link with Parkinson's and like, muscular skeletal pain because I feel like the hip pain the back pain the knee pain I feel like it's just almost everybody with Parkinson's has it of course there's aging but we know that that Parkinson's can affect every system in our body and I think managing that chronic pain when you're exercising, that can be one of those hurdles, right? Where you really have to problem solve. How can I still exercise despite some of this pain? Sometimes aquatic therapy can help. Sometimes there's figuring out exercises that don't put that pressure on your hips, but I think it's definitely worthwhile to, to figure out how you can still walk. I think walking is one of the best exercises you can do for sure. Okay, I keep walking when it hurts, and then finally it kind of goes away, generally speaking. Thank yeah, you. yeah, make sure you talk with someone to make sure you're not making any problem worse. But if they give you the green light, I think walking, walking, walking is so good for you. 
Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Bill, definitely have that looked at if you haven't already. But uh, like Megan says, if you're cleared, remember what they used to say in football? Walk it off. So you just got to walk <laughs> it off, Bill. <laughs> okay, baby. All right. Uh, so uh, other questions? We've got a couple more here. Let me go to uh, Larry, and then we'll come back to Natalie's iPad. Larry, go ahead. No, it's okay. Well, Larry's got to unmute. Mm, there you yes. go. This is Kathleen. Um, Hi, Kathleen. When you mentioned before about some, you said new drugs um, for dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, Larry's been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, but he was, and you mentioned all the side effects. He was put on memantine. Mm -hmm. Is that one that, because I haven't noticed any side effects, but I'm wondering if there are some that are Sneaking internal on. or something that I'm not aware yeah. of. Was that one of the drugs you were maybe referring to? Yes, a lot of people experience um, GI issues, like stomach upset, they feel nauseous, they feel lightheaded. Um, so that's like one of the big ones that I've heard about. Um, do you experience any of that or no? No. Okay, good. Okay, good. Any benefit that you've noticed? Well, uh, I guess no, not yeah. really. I mean, I think they just said hopefully it would slow the memory issues down a little, but they wouldn't progress quite as fast. Yeah. Uh, typically, how long do you need to be on these meds to, to perceive a, a difference? Well, if they're going to help out. I would say about two to four weeks. Okay. Yeah. A lot of times people don't notice it, an impact, but it makes them feel better. Like, well, at least I'm doing something. At least there's medication that I'm trying. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, Natalie. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for an excellent presentation, but I'm wondering if you could say a few words about diet. Yeah, absolutely. So diet for brain health, we know that processed foods create so much inflammation in our body and in our brain, right? But it's hard. It's hard to just eat meat and, and vegetables and, and fruit. It's so much easier to go for those snack foods. But I think even if we cut it down, the processed foods and the sugar, to, to less than what we're consuming now. That's helpful. Of course, you have to be mindful when you're taking your medications. I think they suggest an hour in between your Parkinson's meds and eating so that your, your system can properly absorb all of your medication. I think they say don't eat and take your Parkinson's meds at the same time. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of diet, we know that like the Mediterranean diet um, is really helpful. Um, I think the key is not eating the processed food and the sugar, which is so hard. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, Harvey, you got your hand up. You want to pop off a of mute and ask. We're gonna we're yes. reaching the top of the hour here, so we'll have time for a couple more questions. So um go ahead, Harvey. My question is um can you tell the difference between your mood between depression and Parkinson's and one or the other? your mood and depression? Yes. yes. Yeah, so those actually are synonymous. When someone has a mood disorder, they have depression. So we use those interchangeably. Of course, someone can have be in a bad mood, and that doesn't mean they have depression. In order for it to be clinical depression, you have to experience that sad mood or that down mood for most days for at least two weeks. So if you just have a bad couple of days, that doesn't mean you have depression, but if, it, if it's pretty pronounced and it gets in the way of you doing things that you need to do, and it lasts for at least two weeks, then it could be the, the clinical depression. And there's a lot of medications that can be helpful in treating depression with Parkinson's. There's some medications like benzodiazepines that you just take as needed, 
But those medications we don't like as much. Those are the ones that can be more addictive, can have more of a fall risk. The SSRIs are the ones you take every day, regardless of how you're feeling, you take this medication to help your mood. And those ones are not habit forming. They don't put you at greater risk of falling. And those can be really helpful in boosting your mood. So I would definitely encourage you guys to talk with your primary care providers about trying one of the, the SSRIs to treat some of the depression. I think that can be really helpful. We know that the medication and psychotherapy give us the best result when we do both of those together. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I'm going to actually be indulgent here and ask one question that I've noticed. Um, I've noticed that when there's like an, a, a, an event, a physical event or an injury or a hospital stay can really rack havoc uh, with the, the symptoms of Parkinson's. Do you notice that as well with cognitive stuff? And does that, that, that doesn't mean the person has a new baseline, I assume, that maybe there can be some sort of disruption in their cognitive by an event like that. Do you notice that? Absolutely, yeah. And I think that that can be true. A lot of times it's a stepwise thing. They're maintaining, they're maintaining, they're maintaining, and then something will happen, a hospitalization, a UTI, um, a stressor in their life. And then they sort of have that decline, but then they're even, 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 and then it's a decline, even, even, and it's like kind of that stepwise decline, which a lot of us experience. Yeah. It's like our brain is holding on, holding on, but then something extra happens and we're just not able to compensate for that. And you can, you yeah. can feel it. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to go one more question. I'm going to go to Marty, if you can pop your mute off real quick or at the top of the hour. This has been fantastic, Megan. Um, we would love, everyone really loved it. I'm getting messages all over here. What a great presentation. Um, so maybe we'll have you back in a couple of months to talk about sleep, if you're willing. We'd love to have you back. This was really great. Really clean, Gosh, guys, you're uh, fun. powerful presentation. All right, everybody, let's give a virtual round of applause to Megan. Thank you so much, Megan.